Yeah, I'll just, I'll just stand. <laughs> All right, we'll go and get started. Thanks for joining us. Um, first things first, please make sure your phones are on silent. Turn the ringers off. Uh, I'll start with a line acknowledgement. University of Washington acknowledges the coast village peoples of this land. The land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands of the Duwamish, Puyallup, Suquamish, Kualup, and Muckleshoot Nations. It's our pleasure to have Fort Train May House here from MIT, presenting our DYSF dinner today. We will hit DYSF dinner during the summer. Fort is a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow pursuing his PhD in chemical engineering at MIT. His research in the Russia group centers on the design of redox flow batteries, applying chemical and electrochemical engineering principles to better understand design trade offs for constituent materials. He's also an executive editor for the MIT Science Policy Review, a fellow in the Kimmy Communication Lab, and a representative of this Chemical Engineering Graduate Student Advisory Board. Prior to graduate school, prior to graduate school, Richard received his BS in Chemical Engineering from Ohio University. He's passionate about educating next generation chemical engineers, developing electrochemical technologies to address modern sustainability challenges. Please join me, welcome, Bert. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you all so much for having me and for hosting me. It's all been wonderful and I've gotten to meet a lot of you today. So thank you all for that. Um, so as Brendan mentioned, I'm really excited about electrochemical systems and really broadly electrochemical technologies. Um, so I'm on a chemical engineer by training, but I really consider myself to be an electrochemical engineer. And the reason those systems fascinate me so much is because they're these really perfect examples of chemical engineering. They play a lot on mass and energy balances, transport, thermokinetics, reactor engineering, all of these things that to me really embody chemical engineering. And I think they're this really perfect application of it. So while I definitely hope to impart some knowledge on the rational design of redox flow batteries, what I hope you take away from this talk is really how we as chemical engineers can apply our skills to electrochemical systems. And so at a high level, that's very high level, but really, I need to be on. Um, I think I need to click on this. Great. So my research is really focused around energy. And the reason for that is it's going, it's pivotal in the road to decarbonization. So energy really affects everything we do and is going to be you know, a pivotal part of the decarbonization process. And so if we grossly oversimplify our power grid, Really, we have energy being generated at coal and gas-fired power plants and being distributed to the residential and industrial sectors. Now, coal and gas emits a large amount of CO2, which kind of affects everything downstream from it as far as CO2 emissions are concerned and as far as carbon is concerned. And so one solution to this kind of overarching problem, again, at a high level, is to in introduce renewables into this equation. So things like wind and solar are becoming increasingly cheap and are great for incorporating into the grid. But you know, this isn't kind of a lone solution to the problem because we have kind of an inherent problem in this, right? And that's this kind of balance of supply and demand where the sun isn't always shining and the wind isn't always blowing, as they say. And all that is to say that our generation of solar and wind power doesn't always line up with our demand. So we're off in a typical diurnal cycle here. We're generating more energy during the day. Wind is often pretty steady. And then but we're generating more during the day and not generating it at night where our demand is actually peaking. And so to kind of uncover cover these intermittencies, we need some form of energy storage to charge and discharge this ener or energy into and out of the grid at times of peak demand versus peak supply. And there are a number of ways to do this. And really, this is going to require a range of technologies. But one way we can look at this is from the storage and delivery time scale. So as far as really more optimal integrations, things like solid state batteries. So most of you are probably familiar with lithium ion that's in your phones, maybe if you're lucky in your cars. And so these things often run on shorter duration, second hours most efficiently, which I'll talk a little more about what that means on the next slide. But on the short term, we maybe want something like lithium ion. In the long term, we maybe want something like pumped hydro. So this is really efficient for, um, for storing energy. We've done this for centuries as a society. Pump water uphill to store energy, let it flow back downhill during uh, to release that energy. But not everywhere has mountains, not everywhere has this infrastructure to do pumped hydro. So it's not the ultimate solution here. And in the middle somewhere, we see redox flow batteries. At least we see this as being its best application, this kind of mid duration range where we're talking um, hours to days for the diurnal cycle or multiple days. And as you might have gleaned from my title, this is going to be the focus of my talk and really is the focus of what my research group does. Now, 
To give you a little background on what a redox flow battery is, I think it makes sense to start with our tradition, maybe more traditional solid state batteries where something like lithium ion stores energy in solid materials. So often you have an anode and a cathode that is storing electrons during charge and discharge. Those electrons are moved from one electrode to the other to store and release energy. But there's a problem in doing that at, in scaling that up. And that is that if we wanna store more energy, we need to just make this battery bigger or we need more batteries. So that is to say the energy and power of a battery are coupled. And that means if we wanna scale this up to store large amounts of energy, the cost is pretty much linear. We just buy more batteries to store more energy. Uh, what a redox flow battery does is instead of storing energy in the solid phase, we store energy in the liquid phase. So we store energy in molecules dissolved in electrolytes. Those electrolytes are stored in reservoirs and then pumped through an electrochemical reactor that stores the battery. So if we wanna store more energy, we just increase the size of our tanks. So we have larger reservoirs. If we wanna increase the amount of power, we increase the size of our reactor. And so what this effectively does is it decouples our energy and power. And by turning it into an open system, we also greatly simplify manufacturing. So this is already an open system. So these things become a lot more modular. If we wanna replace individual components for maintenance or plug and play different parts of the cell, we can very, much more easily do that uh, than, the, than a solid state battery where you just have to replace the whole thing. But you may have noticed you don't really see these everywhere and that's because really current embodiments are too expensive. And one way to look at this is from the capital cost. So battery cost is often measured in dollars per kilowatt hour of stored energy. And we look at this in terms of discharge duration. So how long we're storing that energy. And like I mentioned with lithium ion, this is a pretty linear line. We just buy more batteries when we want to store more energy. But for a redox flow battery, we transition from short durations to long durations, where our cost goes from being entirely driven by the power components, that's our reactor, to being entirely driven by the energy storing components, which are mostly the electrolyte and the reservoirs. And well, this is fairly competitive at the moment, you know, there's still a lot of risk associated with like with new technologies like this. And so lithium ion often wins out. And so a lot of my research is looking at how we design future redox flow batteries. So what new materials, what new um, reactors can we design to bring about performance and cost improvements? And to grossly oversimplify what this battery cost is made up of, this dollars per kilowatt hour figure is a function of both the, of course, the raw cost of our materials, but also the performance. So the energy density, how, how much energy we're packing into a unit volume, it's cycling efficiency. So how efficient we're inputting and outputting energy and it's lifetime. So how much maintenance we need to do on it, what we need to replace, how stable our materials are. And really this amounts to a lot of open space for means by which we can improve performance. And so to give you a sense of that, I think it makes sense to, to crack open our battery and kind of show you what what the components is, what, what the components are, and what are we working with to improve performance. So starting with the electrolytes, these are often either inorganic active species. So um, inorganic species that can undergo transitions to different redox states. So think van uh, vanadium I showed you is the state of the art. Um, iron two goes to iron three. These can also be organic molecules. So different organic molecules can transfer electrons to enter different oxidation states. Um, these are particularly interesting because as I you see these R groups here, you can functionalize and tune these molecules to impart different properties. And so I'll come back to the kind of different advantages we can do with that. But this gives you a sense of what types of materials we're working with. And then these are often dissolved in some solvent, either aqueous or non-aqueous with a supporting electrolyte or additional salts to impart conductivity. And what you'll see as a common theme as I'm going through this is that all of the materials in the redox flow battery space have inherent design trade-offs. We're always looking for some happy medium between our properties. So on one hand, what we want from these materials is we want them to access high voltages, high amounts of energy. And we also want them to be highly soluble. So the more molecules we can pack into a solution, the more energy or the more electrons we can store in that, in that electrolyte. But this is often at odds with things like stability. So as we put molecules into more unfavorable energetic states, they're often gonna be less stable and they're gonna decompose through various pathways or undergo side reactions. So we're always balancing these, some of these trade-offs with respect to our active species. And then beyond our electrolytes, we also have our reactors. This is where kind of all the, all the magic and all the electrochemistry happens. So we have our, our active species A on one side. Um, during charge and discharge, this is oxidized and reduced in the reactor. 
So we take A, we oxidize it to A plus. This electron then travels through an external circuit to the other side and reacts with some oxidized species B plus and reduces that to B. And this is a complete um, electrochemical equation that balances our charge. Now, in our reactor, we have these reactions take place at porous carbon electrodes. These are materials that are kind of microporous with high surface areas. They can be woven, they can be kind of carbon fibers all bound together. And really, we're just creating a lot of space for active or for reactions. So, in terms of our design trade offs, we want something that has a lot of surface area, but we're also trying to pump uh, electrolyte through these materials. So, we need them to have relatively low hydraulic resistance, such that we're not spending all of our energy trying to pump the electrolyte into the reactor. Now, lastly, the cells are divided by either an ion exchange membrane or some sort of size selective membrane. And what these serve to do is insulate our electrodes from, self, uh, from short circuiting. And they also need to conduct our supporting electrolyte while blocking our active species from crossing through the membrane. If those cross through the membrane, we're going to lose energy and lose the amount of electrons we can store. That leads to a lot of inefficiencies. So what we then need to do is have membranes with high enough ionic conductivity so that we limit voltage losses, but we also want to limit our active species per permeability. So this is a, a classic problem in membrane design, right? We want to impart high selectivity while maintaining high transport rates. Now, what you're kind of seeing from all of this is kind of the challenge I was faced with as I was entering my PhD, which was we have all of these materials with all these different design trade-offs and somewhere we have to make, make a compromise. But all we're really left with are these kind of design heuristics, right? We know we want this property, we want this property, but what extent do we want one versus the other and how can we really effectively design an optimal system when we have all of these trade-offs? And so this really boils down to two questions is, if we have a set of materials and conditions, what performance are we gonna expect those materials to have? And then there's the inverse problem. If we wanna obtain a specified performance, what materials are we gonna choose? And this question doesn't have a very clear cut answer. And like everything in chemical engineering, it depends, right? But the way in which we determine the extent to which something depends is often through developing models. And models for these systems is really gonna be the focus of my talk. Now, I think at this point, it makes sense to confess that I consider myself to be more of an experimentalist. Um, I'm certainly not a, a computationally focused person, but when I, I entered my PhD, there was really this open question that we needed models to answer. But I really sought to develop much more practical models, things that as an experimentalist I could use and kind of apply to my research and better understand experimental systems and help design experiments. And so to begin to develop these models, um, that's, or I'm gonna kind of go into how we start to bring our chemical engineering framework to kind of develop models for redox flow batteries. So I often like to think of redox flow batteries really as like these miniature chemical processes. And this is very true of a lot of electrochemical systems, but we have our electrolytes stored in some tanks, we have pumps, we have a reactor. And only the only difference between this and maybe a traditional chemical process is we're using current and voltage to drive our reactions as opposed to temperature, temperature and pressure. So again, we're gonna have these redox reactions occurring on either side of either half of our cell. We have species A and A plus, B and B plus, and we're gonna apply some current, some driving force for the reaction. What's really interesting about current is this is, we're just imparting a number of electrons at a given rate. So we're just controlling the rate of this reaction, really. And that's what's I think beautiful about electrochemistry is we control the rates of reactions using current. So if we drive this reaction at a constant current, and we kind of take, take our electrolytes, we charge them up, and we can look at the concentrations as a function of time. And because our reaction rate's constant, our change in concentration as a function of time is gonna be constant. And so we get these kind of linear charge and discharge profiles net where our discharge species concentration is dropping and our charge species concentration is increasing. And then we hit some limit and we're gonna go back the other way. We're gonna discharge our cell and invert the concentrations in the opposite direction. And we repeat this over and over again as we cycle the battery. So we charge, discharge, charge, discharge. And while these concentrations are changing, we're also measuring changes in cell voltage. And really, electrochemistry is heavily concerned with the relationship between current and voltage. 
So as these um, equilibrium concentrations are changing, we're measuring some change in the voltage or the change in energy as a function of time. And I'll dig into this a little more, but we have, or the voltage at which we're doing this is called the open circuit voltage. So that's kind of the theoretical energy of our system as measured by a voltage. And then as we're charging and discharging, we're either inputting more energy during charge and outputting less energy than this theoretical limit. And that defines our voltaic efficiency. And then when we hit these limits, as, we, as these concentrations go to zero, we run out of our reacting species. And so there's nothing left to do and the voltage starts to increase or decrease towards infinity. These points are what give us our charge capacity and our discharge capacity. And all of these metrics are really gonna define our, our system. Now, as a chemical engineer, when I see everything involved here, I see mass balances, I see energy balances, I see, I see transport, I see reactor engineering, and all of these things really kind of bring out, bring out my excitement about modeling a problem like this. And like any good chemical engineer, I'm gonna look at, look at my system and I'm gonna find out just where am I gonna draw my boxes? So I might take this, this whole system, a squint at it a little bit, squint at it a little bit more. And really what I see is this looks just like two batch reactors, right? We have reactions going in these kind of homogeneously mixed systems. We're gonna make our typical assumptions. These things are well mixed, they're isothermal. And all we're doing is applying some current as a reaction driving force. Uh, maybe we have some decay mechanism. So like I said, these species aren't stable. They might undergo some homogeneous decay reactions where either our charge species goes to some discharge state D or maybe it self discharges back to its original state. Uh, and then we also have to incorporate facets of our membrane where we have some crossover of these species where they, by some concentration gradient or by some properties of the membrane, these species are gonna cross from one electrolyte to the other. And this type of approach to looking at this problem is really really the benchmark of my, my PhD work. So we can take our picture of, of a model, apply it to a flow battery, and what this model essentially serves to do is generate a framework for connecting our materials properties, things like I talked about with the electrolyte, electro and the membrane, and couple that with our operating conditions and predict some amount of performance and stability for our system. Really developing a framework for connecting these things together such that we can effectively predict performance and connect these things together. And so my talk today is gonna to focus on two vignettes into this framework, looking at the electro how we can understand the effect of electrolyte properties and how we can understand the effect of membrane properties. So starting with the electrolyte properties and of course take into account how we're operating those electrolytes. Uh, our story, here is gonna revolve around more molecular engineering. So how we tune properties of electrolytes. And so if I wanted to take this reaction A to A plus, if I wanted to store more energy in an electrolyte, I can do one of two things. I can increase the solubility of this molecule that allows me to pack more electrons into the, into the reaction volume. Alternatively, I can also extend this reaction, and get another electron out of a molecule. If there's a molecule or an active species that can transfer two electrons, I've effectively doubled my energy density by getting one additional electron per unit volume. And there's a number of different molecular families that can do these types of electron transfers. I'm just highlighting a couple here of phenazines, quinones, biologins, some metal centered coordination complexes. And there's a range of uh, different properties, again, we can impart by tuning the structure of these. But while we can, of course, double our number of electrons, like everything, it doesn't come for free. And as I'm gonna walk you through here, um, these, this improved atom economy really comes at a performance cost. So to show you kind of what I mean, uh, we'll take this phenothiazine molecule and what we'll often do in testing kind of the stability and the performance of molecules, we'll put it in a bulk electrolysis cell. So we'll just take one electrolyte, we'll charge it at a constant current and we're gonna measure the voltage response uh, with respect to an, a reference electrode. And you often see curves that look like this. Now, instead of those charging curves I showed you before, you're seeing two plateaus here uh, in terms of the voltage. And each of these plateaus corresponds to a, an individual electron transfer reaction. So at a lower energy or at a lower voltage, I'm oxidizing A to A plus. And then as we go to a higher energy state, it takes a little more energy to get that second electron out of a molecule. So we observe that at a higher plateau. And if we discharge it, we see the opposite behavior. So now we're gonna 
go back from A2 plus to A plus, and then go back to that lower energy um, going from A plus to A. Now, in an ideal world, what we would see is that these plateaus should each take up about half of our total time. But hopefully you can see that that's not the case. And we're actually spending a lot more time at this higher energy state when we're charging. And this asymmetry gives us a lot of problems. Effectively, we're charging our battery with spending a lot more time at the higher voltage. And when we're discharging, we're spending a lot more time at the lower voltage. So this difference in our charge and discharge voltage, as I showed you with the cycling curves, is going to impart some voltaic inefficiencies. And they actually become pretty staggering if you look at this under, under various conditions. And so we were our lab before me was uh, developing these molecules and kind of testing their stability. But we kind of looked at this and kind of asked, like, what price are we really paying to improve our capacity? And in, in essence, is it worth it? And so again, to answer that question, we're developing these zero dimensional models. So again, we're taking this well mixed system, we're kind of ignoring spatial variations in our, in our reactor and our reservoir, and we're just gonna consider this as a batch reactor. Now, instead of A to A plus, now we're incorporating A two plus as well. Um, each of these reactions occur at a different voltage, um, which we'll see in the, in the energy balances. And then the reactions are occurring at individual rates specified by these partial currents. Um, these partial currents just make up the total current that we're applying to our cell. Now to write a mass balance for each of these species, we're just gonna look at the change in concentration as a function of time. So this is just DC, DT applied to this reactor. And then these reactions are occurring at some rate given by those partial currents, which is describing each of those reactions. Now to understand our electrode potentials or our voltages, uh, what I showed you on the last slide, we're going to look at these just as equilibrium processes. So a voltage here is effectively a free energy of a reaction. So this might look familiar to you as a, as a statement of Gibbs free energy as a function of the concentrations. So these are the energy is changing logarithmically with the surface concentrations of the species relative to some standard energy, uh, some uh, standard voltage kind of at ideal conditions. So we measure those differences in concentration and our, relates our electrode potential to our concentration of our species at the surface of an electrode where the reactions are actually occurring. And this is just an equilibrium process. Now, those surface concentrations, we can relate to bulk concentrations by just assuming there's some generalized advective mass transport. So our rate of our reaction in electrode surface is just given by the total area of that electrode S and some mass transfer coefficient based on the difference in those surface concentrations. This is just a really just a statement of convection or advective mass transport. Now, there's a lot of parameters that kind of go into this, but like, like a chemical engineer, I'm going to take this and scale it and uh, identify some dimensionless groups. So I'm going to first non-dimensionalize the concentration theta by the total species concentration. Uh, I'm going to identify some theory or dimensionless capacity. This is a dimensionless time where I'm non-dimensionalizing the time by the total time it takes to deliver one equivalent of electrons. So what that means is that when tau is one, I will have transferred all the electrons from A to A plus. And when tau is two, I'll have gotten a second equivalent of electrons. So you'll see this on some of the figures I show you. Now, we're also going to define a dimensionless current. So this is the current divided by our mass transfer limiting current. So the mass transfer limit tells us how much current we can apply before one of these concentrations just already plummets to zero when we try to apply that reaction rate. And so psi is never going to be greater than one. And mass transport, as you see, creates a lot of problems in terms of system design. It's kind of one of our key design parameters in a lot of electrochemical systems. Now, to deal with the potentials, make them match a little bit. I'm going to define a potential difference. So this is the difference between those plateaus I showed you on the last slide. This is the difference in energy required to do those two different electron transfers. And then I'm also going to define some average of those. This is, in essence, the open circuit voltage I showed you on the uh, a few slides ago. And so we can take all of this information and model it together. And what we start and what we start to see are various behaviors. And so to kind of break this down, I'm gonna introduce these parameters in, in steps, just so we can better visualize their individual effects on the reaction. So if I don't have a potential difference and I apply just a constant value of psi, which is pretty realistic for a, a battery we might operate in the lab, 
you see those typical curves I showed you before, where you have one plateau, these go up to infinity when we hit that mass transfer limit and our surface concentrations go to zero. Now, if I introduce, oh, and then this is going to be just shy of our theoretical capacity, which as I said, is gonna be tau equals two. That's when we can get all of our electrons out of the system. Now, if I introduce that voltage difference at this value of psi, we not only see that difference in the plateaus, but we're also able to capture that kind of asymmetric effect where we're spending more time at our high plateau and less time at our low voltage plateau during charging and vice versa during discharging. Now, this is, gives us a good kind of qualitative understanding of what's happening, but I think you really start to see these effects come out as you vary the value of psi. So psi, as I mentioned, is a pretty realistic value, or 2.25 is pretty realistic, and it's kind of what you saw in the previous slides. But if we start to lower this, we see our movement to that more idealized state where we're spending about half of our time at the low plateau, half of our time at the high plateau. That's because we're operating this at pretty low currents, so we're not pushing our system too far out of equilibrium, and so we're operating around that more idealized state. Now, if you, we were to increase this value, we see actually the opposite behavior where we're gonna start to shrink this plateau until we hit a value of 0.5 where that first plateau entirely disappears. We're operating at half of our theoretical uh, mass transfer limiting current. And so we're pushing all the way from A to A2 plus um, at that current. Now, this is still just kind of qualitative, trying to understand how these parameters affect our performance trends. But if we wanna know how it's actually affecting performance, we need to quantify some efficiency. And this is going to be what we'll call the voltaic efficiency, where we measure the average discharge voltage relative to the average charging voltage. So we're just gonna average out those curves. And this is gonna tell us the total efficiency with which we're using our energy. And if we look at this as a function of psi, we can see kind of the effects I showed you on the last slide kind of come together. So because of that asymmetry between the plateaus, we kind of, we see this rapid drop in our voltaic efficiency. So dropping from one at that uh, optimal state all the way down. And then when we see the disappearance of that bottom plateau, this, we see this kink in the graph and it starts to level out. And now these are like pretty high values. So hopefully we're not operating at those states, but even at pretty realistic values, we see a pretty significant drop in voltaic efficiency. And I'm only looking at one half of the reaction without any other voltage losses. So dropping to a value of 0.9, or if you double that to 0.8, um, if we're looking at both sides, that's already a pretty, not, that's not such a great floor to, with which we're operating around our voltaic efficiency. Um, now, this efficiency is of course gonna be a function of our difference in those potentials. So as we go to larger differences between the redox potentials, our voltage difference gets, gets a lot worse, but if we're operating without any voltage difference, then we're operating at least under these conditions at pretty good voltaic efficiencies. Now, another way we can begin to vary, or we can begin to either improve or lower our performance is if we change this value of E average. Effectively, if we just increase the value of our denominator and numerator, we're going to increase our efficiency just naturally. And so these voltages here, two volts and three volts, this is pretty typical of a non-aqueous battery. I mean, you see these kind of values a lot in literature, um, but aqueous electrolytes are limited by the breakdown of water. So they can't go much beyond one volt. And so if we lower that to something like an aqueous system, this performance is gonna be pretty bad um, under, under these large voltage differences. And so that kind of brings into question again, how much is it worth it? And what we really, from going through this analysis, what we really drew from it is that two electron species are pretty significantly limited by, by this voltage gap, right? We're taking pretty big hits to our voltaic efficiency before we even account in or factor in any additional losses. And so it creates a bit of a natural limit to kind of the applicability of these materials under certain sets of conditions. So to kind of sum up the points around this, the story on electrolyte properties, um, what we kind of learned from this was that two electron compounds can significantly hinder our energy efficient, or our voltaic and our energy efficiency. Um, and so from this, we were able to kind of suggest some molecular engineering strategies. Really, we, our goal here should really be to um, limit that gap between the materials or between the redox potentials, which has kind of hopefully helped kind of pivot the field toward looking at this a little more extensively. And there are a lot of examples of doing this um, in some a lot older literature. But 
maybe more importantly, what we took away from this is this was our, really our first foray into using these types of zero dimensional models. We realized we could really learn a lot from, from this just for these multi electron transfer materials, but we took away from this that there were a lot of instances where we can generalize these types of models to account for a lot of different uh, materials. And that's where it really brought us back to this picture of you know, generating these relationships between all of these different material properties and all of these operating conditions. So that was electrolyte properties. Now, as we were going through this, we also identified the membrane, of course, as being a really critical component. It had, serves a lot of purposes and is one of the largest sources of loss in, in, a, in a redox flow battery. And so that's going to be the second vignette I'm going to tell you about, which is kind of how we use the, this type of modeling framework to understand uh, how the membrane influences our cell performance and our stability. Now, the problem we're looking at from a modeling standpoint is a little different now. What I was showing you with the two electron species was just single charge and discharge curves. That was just one cycle just to get a sense of really the upper bound of performance. But when we're looking at the effect of the membrane, we're dealing with species continuously crossing the membrane over time. So we're looking at stability here in terms of our capacity as a function of cycle number. So we're running tens or hundreds of cycles to really elicit what effect this membrane has. And that actually starts to be a problem when we're thinking about computation. And so what I showed you before, um, and in addition, some other papers that use kind of similar frameworks, these, thing, these simulations take quite a bit of time. So we're looking at anywhere from 30 seconds to two minutes to solve these kind of uh, mass balances where we're just looking at changes in concentration as a function of time. These equations can be a little bit stiff and they can be, um, and we need them to be kind of discrete enough that we get um, enough information about our performance. Now, when we're looking at this time to just do one charge and discharge cycle, um, I mentioned we need to do something like tens to hundreds to elicit membrane performance. And so computationally, this becomes like a pretty intractable problem. But as we were kind of looking at the equation, figuring out how to go about this, how can we make this computationally more efficient? We started to realize that there are actually analytical solutions in a lot of cases to these mass balances. And so this was our way to look and try to generalize these relationships. And by develop, developing analytical solutions, we can simulate these much, much faster, these orders of magnitude, because we're just really inputting equations and saying, this is the answer. So it makes this a lot more efficient with which we can do these computations. And it also opens up a wide range of more versatile analyses that would have been too computationally intensive to do, to really to do otherwise, or to do at least do very efficiently. So just to highlight a few and a few places we're going with this. Um, being able to just, as an experimentalist, predict performance prior to cell testing, being able to say, I have these materials, how should I expect this thing to behave? Um, but we can also do some kind of inverse analysis doing kind of parameter estimation, process control. It opens up a, quite a wide range of analyses we can do. And so what I'm gonna walk through is kind of how these analytical solutions come together from that zero dimensional or that chemical engineering framework. Um, and so here we're looking at how the membrane is is in, um, informing our performance. And like I mentioned, we want a membrane that's effectively conducting our supporting electrolyte. So we want it to have high conductivity. Um, otherwise, we're going to have some resistance to the flow of ions across this membrane. And that's gonna, we're gonna encounter that as a voltage loss um, or as, as an additional resistance to our, to our system. But we also need to block the, the crossover of our species. But, in order to predict performance, we need to know what the flux of these looks like. So in a typical picture of what a species is doing as it interacts with this membrane, we're gonna have some species, in this case, this is our negative species B, that's going to go into our membrane, it's gonna sort, absorb into the membrane through some sorption coefficient, um, and that membrane is gonna have some thickness L, and it's gonna transport through the membrane along some concentration gradient and some potential gradient or some electric field uh, given by the resistance of the membrane and the amount of current we're trying to push through it. And then that species is going to desorb into our other electrolytes. So we have concentrations of this species now on both sides of our cell. Now, some of our colleagues a few years ago, we kind of looked at this problem just of membrane transport, and we're able to derive some analytical expressions for the flux in terms of all of these parameters. I won't go into the depth of how we got here, 
but we're looking at some flux of the species as a function of the diffusion. So this is kind of the concentration gradient through the membrane. And then we have some function gamma, which is which describes the strength of the electric field and how that um, put how that moves species through the through the membrane. Now, if we look at this equation, it looks a little complicated, but really what I want you to point out or what I want to point out is that well, these are all constants. This is becomes really just first order in terms of either of our concentrations on either side of the membrane. So if we take this flux equation, we redimensionalize it in terms of our zero dimensional uh, parameters. We can treat these essentially as, as rate constants. These are what I term crossover rate constants. And having these as first order processes is super important for how we're gonna solve it. Now, this we're gonna incorporate back into our zero dimensional model. Only now, instead of one batch reactor, what I showed you before, we're gonna have two where we're accounting for both of our species. Again, we're applying some current to our system and we're accounting for crossover through the membrane. We're gonna cast the same types of mass balances. So we're gonna look at the change in concentration as a function of time. Now we have just a constant current we're applying to the system and we have some reaction terms, which is gonna account for our crossover. It could also account for species decay. I won't incorporate that here, but just wanna mention it. Now we're gonna make the same kind of sets of equations about our energy. We're gonna write this statement of the free energy um, or the equilibrium electrode potential as a function of the surface concentration. And now we only have just one standard redox potential for, e for each of these reactions. And we're gonna make the same statement about advective mass transport relating our bulk concentrations to our surface concentrations. And we can start to look at how, what performance factors this draws out. So our cell voltage is going to be the difference between the positive and negative electrode potentials. This is as each of these species has different redox potentials, that's gonna set that difference as a function of kind of the thermodynamics and the mass transport to those electrodes. And then we also have some additional ohmic losses. These are primarily due to the membrane and we're gonna quantify it as, as based on the membrane conductivity. So we have our cell voltage. Now our capacities are going to be as, as you saw earlier, when the concentration of our species at the electrode surface goes to zero, that's gonna tell us our charging time. And our capacity is just the product of the current and that time. So that's the total number of coulombs or milliamp hours that we get out of our, our electrolytes. And then from this, we can define some efficiencies. So our voltaic efficiency is again, just that uh, average discharge voltage over that average charging voltage. And our coulombic efficiency is the discharge capacity relative to the charging capacity. So how many electrons are we putting in versus how many electrons are we getting out? And because these species cross through the membrane, we lose some of that capacity um, when we charge versus when we discharge. And so that's where the coulombic efficiency is gonna come from here. And so a lot of equations here, but really what I wanna point out is that all of this, all of these other equations, all of our performance factors rely really only on solving these mass balances. If we solve the mass balances and we know the concentrations as a function of time, everything else here just falls out. We can just calculate everything else once we know the concentration. So this model is all gonna boil down to solving the mass balances. And the way we're gonna do that, again, is incorporating now our membrane transport factors. We're gonna have our change in concentration as a function of time. We can define this um, side reaction rate as amounting to our crossover. So this is just related to the flux of all our species. And again, these fluxes are just first order rate constants. So what we end up with are a bunch of coupled ordinary differential equations in terms of first order chemical reactions. And that's a quintessential problem in reactor engineering and chemical kinetics and something that's been solved, solved decades ago. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all of these coupled differential equations of all our species. We're gonna recast it as a vector matrix differential equation. So we have vectors of all of our species concentrations and then we have some matrix K, which is accounting for all of our rate constants. Now we have some, we're gonna have some initial condition at the initial time. And then we can take that rate matrix and perform an eigen decomposition. So we can cast that in terms of its eigenvectors and its eigenvalues. And that allows us to change our coordinate system from C to this theta. And then we can write the write theta in terms of it's just the eigen, eigenvalues of that matrix. And it won't give you the detailed kind of rigorous uh, derivation here, but 
we can take these thetas and tr transform them back into our concentrations. And what we've derived essentially is an analytical solution for our mass balances, which again, we can use to uh, calculate all of our performance factors. So to give you a little bit of a picture of what that looks like, um, first, we can just predict a couple cycling curves just to give us some picture that, okay, this model makes sense. This is what we expect to see in terms of cycling performance, where here I'm just giving you different current densities. Um, you have our open circuit voltages here. I'm setting these to be two volts, kind of as you saw in the, in the two electron work. And kind of the things you can kind of, you can see in this visualization are as we apply higher current densities, we have some ohmic resistance. So as we increase that, that um, current, we're increasing the voltage difference between charge and discharge. So you can see a little more area between this kind of gray line and between these lines. So as you increase the current, we're gonna encounter larger resistances, mostly again, due to our membrane. So this is mostly just a picture of, um, to kind of give us some reassurance that we can predict performance pretty well and it makes sense within our um, electrochemical engineering framework. Now, uh, but what this, what having an analytical model really allows us to do is perform larger parametric sweeps. So we can effectively generate maps of performance as a function of different parameters. And so one way we can look at this in is in terms of our membrane resistance and the applied current as I was kind of showing you on the last slide. So here we're gonna look at our membrane resistance as this area specific resistance. So we're just gonna take the thickness of our membrane divided by its conductivity. That, tell, that gives us a value of ohms square centimeter. And we look at efficiency in the same way we did before as a function of the applied current or the driving force. And again, we see this effect that as we increase the current density, we increase the driving force, we lower our voltaic efficiency as we're encountering more ohmic losses. And similarly, as we increase the resistance, we're going to go up, go to larger over potentials or larger, larger voltage losses. And that's going to manifest as lower voltaic efficiencies. Likewise, we can or similar to the two electron work, we can extend this to looking at different open circuit voltages. And as we saw before, at higher open circuit voltages, we can hit much higher voltaic efficiencies as we increase kind of that numerator and denominator. And so this gives us kind of a map or at least a little bit of an operating envelope which with, with which we can effectively choose materials and operating conditions um, that impart at least reasonable voltaic efficiency and kind of gives us a sense of where our, where our compromises are or where our happy mediums are. So this tells us a lot about the voltaic efficiency, but that's only part of the story. We also have to look at kind of the stability of the system. So how the capacity changes as a function of time. So now if we look at this across multiple cycles um, for just a constant current of 10 milliamps per square centimeter that I showed you before, and a membrane conductivity of 10 millisiemens per centimeter and a diffusion coefficient, which is relatively high. And what we see is pretty typical of systems undergoing crossover is that we start at our initial capacity and as species start to cross through the membrane, we reach this plateau at about half of our original capacity. That's because the electrolyte species are crossing through the membrane and then completely, the electrolytes are completely mixing. So we have now our electrolytes are fully mixed and we now we no longer really have a concentration gradient driving any differences across the system. So we get this kind of, nice happy equilibrium at half of our original capacity, which isn't great. We've lost a lot of energy to that. Now we can look at this as a function of different diffusion coefficients. So if our membrane gets a little more selective, we should be able to get rid of some of that capacity fade and allow our system to last a lot longer as we slow transport. And the way we can then kind of take this information and look at it in terms of its uh, voltaic efficiency or its energy efficiency is again, the voltaic efficiency I showed you on the last slide multiplied by the coulombic efficiency, which is the efficiency with, with, with which we're using electrons. And so when we have a lot of capacity fade, we have a lot of difference between our charge and discharge capacities, and this manifests as a pretty low uh, overall energy efficiency. Now, as we kind of remove crossover from the equation, we can approach much, much higher energy efficiencies. That's where our losses are coming from in, as a function of the diffusion coefficient. Now, what we can also do is look at uh, we can fix the diffusion coefficient and look at the effect of conductivity. Now the purple line here, or the purple dots I'm showing you are the same on the left and right, just for guidance. Now, if we start to lower the membrane conductivity, what we see is that we are 
um, not only are we going to in, uh, impart larger voltage losses as we've lowered the conductivity, increase that area specific resistance. We also see this drop in our or increase in our capacity fade, which at first was pretty non intuitive to us. We kind of thought about this diffusion factor and conductivity as kind of these discrete elements. And so to see these large differences was initially surprising. Um, but what we started to realize is that as we lower the conductivity of our membrane, it's much harder to push ions through. And we actually increase the magnitude of the electric field across the membrane, which is going to drive ions at a much faster rate. And so that's what's driving kind of this large difference in capacity fade. So that is lowering our Coulombic efficiency. Our change in conductivity or lowering of conductivity is also lowering our voltaic efficiency. And so we're seeing pretty big hits to our energy efficiency um, under what are pretty mild operating conditions. 10 milliamps per square centimeter for those familiar is like a pretty low value. And so surprisingly from this work, we kind of took away from this that membrane conductivity is a much stronger driver of energy efficiency, which was very different with how we, kind of our group thought about designing membranes and really kind of changed how we were looking at this problem. But I do wanna leave an asterisk here that of course, energy efficiency is a factor of both. And we also need to design these in a way um, where we limit the capacity fade. Um, that can be done through a number of kind of engineering strategies, which I won't go into too much, but you can, you can pre-mix these electrolytes, kind of start here, and that allows you to stop capacity fade while keeping performance pretty stable. So to kind of sum up this work, um, these anal kind of these analytical cell cycling models, um, this kind of more broadly allowed us to develop a more constitutive framework for connecting materials properties and cell cycling performance, which we here I only showed you for membranes, but we've done kind of a number of analyses around it. Um, doing this analytically, of course, uh, lowered our computation time, but also has opened up a wide range of more versatile flow cell analysis, which again, as an experimentalist, I'm using in a ton of different ways to kind of understand or design experiments better and kind of expand the, the extent to which we can do, we can do interesting experiments. Now, Again, I showed you just one kind of vignette into these two things, but really more broadly, this work kind of represents, to me, a kind of reflection of chemical engineering knowledge onto the design of these electrochemical systems. And hopefully what you've taken away is how we can use the frameworks were pretty, that are pretty typical of reactor design, transport, thermodynamics, kinetics, all into better understanding the performance of, of these types of systems. Now, uh, here I'm gonna wrap up, but I wanna make a couple of acknowledgements. I, of course, wanna acknowledge my advisor, Fick, who's been an excellent mentor kind of through my PhD and through helping develop a lot of this work. Um, I wanna thank AJ and Jeff, who um, supported the two electron work. Um, Jeff did a lot of the testing of two electron materials in our group. He left our group right, kind of right as I joined, and then AJ supported a lot of the computational efforts. Um, I also want to acknowledge Jonathan, who was an undergrad in our group and is now starting his PhD at UPenn. He wrote a lot of the code that went into the models in the second project. And I also want to thank Adi, who was, what, was my roommate and colleague and helped me, helped me through a lot of the linear algebra associated with deriving some of these analytical models. Um, lastly, I want to thank the Brescia group, who together are just an excellent group of people to work with and kind of make, make working in the lab every day a lot of fun. Um, and lastly, I want to thank my funding sources. And I want to thank you, you all for your attention, and I am happy to take any questions. All right, now I'll take questions. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so have you done any work on investigating uh, species as charge carriers? Uh, mm. It seems like your systems may or may not be able to handle that for, for modeling. Mm. Uh, what do you mean by mixed species? Uh, mixed charge carriers. So you, uh, you know, things like sorry, one, one electron or two electrons. Uh, um, do you mean like different, like in different oxidation states or different kind of valencies? Uh, different molecules. Okay, so different like. Um, no, not quite understanding the question. <laughs> um, uh, this, yeah, you you showed a bunch of different molecules. Yeah. Oh, you mean as in like if there are multiple species in those kind of electrolytes, how they how they interact with one another? Yeah, or like, you know, yeah. as an electrochemist, you you think about a mixture of molecules that might have some sort of benefit. Mm -hmm. 
benefit that the peer system does. Yes. Have. Okay. Yes. Um, so that's something I haven't taken too much interest in in the model per se, but that's something we've actually done a little bit in collaboration with um, some folks at the University of Kentucky, um, where we were looking at actually, this was in terms of solubility, you see some interesting effects of molecules with which um, alone might have much lower solubilities than you have is like more of like a, what I would consider to be like a eutectic mix. Somehow they interact well together that they both kind of increase their mutual solubility in an electrolyte. So that kind of increases your energy density. Yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, no, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, I think there are a lot of ways we could look at that kind of within the context of a model too, that you know, if we have two species here, kind of similar to the two electron work, um, you can kind of, it, rather than having species undergoing multiple electron transfers, you just have two different species undergoing their own electron transfer. I think a similar framework would describe it. Yeah, thanks for the question. So that's something I think we handle in maybe a more empirical way. The side reactions we absolutely handle with the model. Um, so those we usually take into account as like first order reactions um, kind of in line with the kind of rate constant matrix. Um, so that's something we handle a lot. And you know, we see in a ton of real systems is these molecules are pretty unstable and unfavorable energetic states. So they definitely decay, undergo side reactions. Those are things I didn't show you here, but we definitely treat in kind of the way we approach the model. Um, and then the other question is with the membrane. That's something we, I think, need a little empirical knowledge on to go about how we model that. But we see that in a lot of uh, experimental systems or certain unstable experimental systems, like, like you said, where they clog the membrane or even react with the membrane. And look, that usually lowers its conductivity and lowers the diffusion through the membrane. And so the way I would, we've treated that is just kind of applying like from cycle to cycle, let's just increase, increment the resistance over time, you can see kind of those effects on performance as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, yeah, I really like your talk. Um, I'm curious, like, if you were to suggest, let's say, a computational model to try and, let's say, calculate one of the rates of electron transfer, or um, what would you say is like uh, a model? I know you, you've been using uh, analytical models. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, have you thought about like what electrolyte and sort of like what surface? Like, how would you develop mm. this computational model to help answer the electron transfer question, diffusion question? Yeah. No, that's and that's you get it a huge pro or a huge focus area in kind of flow battery research is kind of trying certain systems, and I kind of ignored it a little bit in this model is how the rate or limitation of kind of electron transfer to an electrode surface impacts this. Um, so our paper goes into this a little bit incorporating more kinetic models, but as a, as a general, maybe a more general answer, if I, I were going about kind of that process of trying to understand kinetics, there are a number of experiments with which we can do for that. Um, and one common one is to take the system, instead of looking at time dependencies, you take the system at steady state and you measure its polarization behavior. So you just measure how the voltage at steady state responds to changing currents. And so the different, I wish I had a slide on that actually, but the, the how the voltage responds is gonna elicit differences due to those, these kinetic limitations. But you also see differences in ohmics until, and then eventually you'll see the effect of mass transport at much higher currents. And so that would be kind of the first experiment I would do. And that's um, more, or there are a lot of models also for kind of uh, backing out behavior for that. Yeah. Sure. Oh, okay. Sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Fire away. When you were modeling, you said you're an analytical model. You said these are stiff equations. I thought we just don't know what the stiff equation is. <laughs> um, so it's a stiff differential equation. I this is getting a little computational, but um, so I don't know if I'm going to answer this perfectly. But um, a stiff equation is, is uh, an equation that's changing sharply as a function of kind of your dependent parameter. So it's a lot harder to, it, it basically, because it's changing so fast, you have to really get every discrete point so you catch that change. Otherwise, you 
try to make too big of a step and you like way over predict some, something that might be like plateauing out or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that means, but yeah, that, what that means is you have to take a lot of small time steps. And that means you're just spending a lot more time doing these like kind of numerical calculations. Yeah. Good question. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> you, <laughs> fight, you have to fight amongst yourselves. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I have a very general question. Uh -huh. uh, what do you think about the type of membranes and how it affects the performance of the ADO product provider? Uh, mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a good one. So um, to give a, maybe a little more context to that question too. So in vanadium redox flow batteries, you have a, vanadium is a little different because vanadium accesses four different oxidation states. So when vanadium crosses over, you effectively like vanadium three on the negative side crosses over and just becomes vanadium four or vanadium five. Um, so it doesn't suffer from the same types of capacity fade behavior. And the other thing about vanadium is that has a lot of, it's all cationic and is dissolved in a sulfuric acid. So it has also a lot of protons. And so there's a balance between cation and anion exchange membranes where cation membranes generally tend to be a lot more conductive in these types of electrolytes. So you suffer a lot less voltaic inefficiencies with using those, uh, but you transport species a lot faster. Um, so that leads to more coulombic efficiencies. Um, with anion exchange membranes, you block a little more crossover, um, but you have like a little bit worse voltaic efficiencies as those are a little less conductive. So the answer kind of boils down to, uh, as all, all good things do, it depends, but it really, what it depends on really is the operating conditions here. So like if you're trying to apply high currents and you are cycling very fast and you kind of need lower voltaic or better voltaic efficiencies, you go for the cation exchange membrane. If you're cycling for longer durations and you need to limit crossover a lot more, you go for something maybe like an anion exchange membrane. So that really depends on kind of what you're designing your cell to do. It's actually why operating conditions are so important in kind of trying to understand that behavior. So I wouldn't say cation or anion is like one direction better or worse for the field. It just depends on the type of system you're trying to develop. Yeah. Do you have one more? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I forgot my question. I can, I can come back. <laughs> Jimmy had one. So, what are some of the common mechanisms of degradation or loss of performance in redoxable batteries? And then, mm -hmm. could your models be modified to account for that? Yeah. So, so the ones I hit, hit, hit on here are really the biggest ones that is chemical decay and crossover. Um, so, the model can capture both of those. Um, and accounting for like more complex mechanisms might just mean accounting for additional species. I kind of generalize decay as just like, hey, we're going to some species D or some species A, or, go, okay, or kind of going back to our uncharged species. But we could certainly account for you know, what that is decaying into. Sometimes these decay into other molecules that are redox active. Um, and so that becomes a little more, you know, a little more complicated, but not something we necessarily couldn't handle with this type of framework. Are those rates strictly coming from fit parameters from like benchtop experiments, or are you mm -hmm. predicting them based on the properties of the molecule? Uh, mostly from benchtop experiments. So yeah, the way we would do that, uh, we would test that as we would throw it in an experimental cell and just measure how the capacity changes as a function of time. And usually we can get a good sense of how stable or unstable these molecules are, but we could also take them, put them in their charged states and just measure their decay. And that gives us a sense of kind of what the decay kinetics are. Good question. That's fine. So right. um, to wrap up there, if you have more questions for us, we'll get to the recap show and mm -hmm. guide you up to the end of there. We have a small gift for you to bring you to us. Oh, thank you. you does that. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate yeah, it. Thank, thank you. And thank you all so much for having me. And those I've met with, I've had a really fantastic visit. So thank you for making that so great. And looking forward to seeing some or most of you at the reception.